What if we have gotten the stories that are listed in Luke chapter 15 all wrong? We always focus on the last story, which is the story of the lost son, or the prodigal son, as we like to call it. But it's actually, that chapter is a trilogy of three different stories that Jesus told in a conversation that he had with the religious leaders. In each of those stories, the focus isn't necessarily on the thing that was lost. The focus in the stories is about the person who was seeking. It's about the man who had 90, 100 sheep, one of them went away, and he did everything he could to find that sheep, dropped it all, and walked away. It's about the woman who had 10 coins, and she lost one of them, and she spent every ounce of her energy trying to find that one lost coin. And it's about the father whose son took his inheritance, went away, walked away from everything, but the dad stayed and waited and watched and believed that that child would come back. You see, I think that we've got the, the story backwards, that it's really not about the lost or even what happened. It's about the seeker and the seeker's grace and love and compassion. You know, I grew up in the South. I grew up here in Coleman County, out to the east at Fairview. My dad was a, a pastor. He was a Baptist minister, and he was, he was very conservative. Actually, if you look in the dictionary under ultra-conservative, I think his picture is there as a definition of it. And he was really hard on us as well. But unlike some pastor's kids who rebel against it, I didn't do that. I was just the opposite. I followed and believed it 100%. Even when I was little, I can remember... My dad coming home, and we had dinner, and I, after dinner, I would run and hop up in his lap, taking that big, gigantic family Bible. Some of you remember having one of those. I was about four years old, and when I picked it up and carried it, it seemed like it weighed 100 pounds and was, you know, at least three foot wide on either end, but of course, now that I'm older, I know it's really not that large, but I would get in his lap with that giant thing, open up to the book of John, and I would read to him. It was my favorite book especially the words in red, because I felt like Jesus was talking right to me. And the stories were all about love. They were all about grace. It was all about the, the links that Christ went to in order to have a relationship with mankind. I felt like I was called into ministry, actually, when I was pretty young as well. And because Dad was a pastor, I had some opportunities that other kids probably didn't have. Like in the seventh grade, I started teaching children's church. And that continued on through my life. God opened doors everywhere we lived, even when my husband was in the military and we transferred a lot. I would be in a place of service and ministry. Everything from actually from cleaning the toilets all the way up to being a pastor. And when I was ordained, it wasn't in the Methodist church originally. I was involved in another church where I was licensed and ordained and served. And then after a conversation that I had with a friend who was going through the long, arduous process of becoming a Methodist minister, she challenged me in one of our conversations to really take a look at John Wesley's life and to look at the United Methodist Church and, and the practices and the beliefs and see if possibly the UMC might be a better fit for me. And, you know, I did exactly what she asked me to do. And I'd never looked at the Methodist church, really. I don't think I'd ever attended one because, you know, growing up, we believed that Methodists were cults. Uh, I mean, really, you baptize babies. Of course, Catholics were cults as well. And so were Presbyterians and Episcopals. And, well, probably every church that didn't believe exactly the same way we believed was considered a cult. So I was surprised to see that John Wesley, that, that his beliefs and practices matched mine perfectly. And he believed, of course, that you took the gospel to people, you preached the word to them, but it's just as important if they're hungry to feed them or if they're in distress to care for them. And for those who are, have no voice and are suffering injustice, he believed that you fought for them and you spoke for them. And he was instrumental in working to stop the slave trade. And the Methodist Church believes those things and carries those on, and that was me. And so I did. I went and I met with the DS, worked through the long, arduous process 
which ends with the Board of Ordained Ministry, which we affectionately call the Big Boom, and became a licensed local pastor. And I started serving in a church. It was a little bitty church, but you know I loved being a minister. I absolutely loved it. And of course, I like to preach. I like to talk. That goes with the job, I think. But I loved celebrating all the joys of life with people. I loved to comfort them when they were in a tough spot, when they were dealing with suffering or pain. And I loved standing shoulder to shoulder with them and going out into the world to be the hands and feet of Christ. It was my dream come true. But somewhere along the way, I started to struggle. I don't know what started it or why. I mean, I can't tell you how many times people have asked me, what was that one thing that that one event, and you know, there's really not one. And if it, there is, I don't remember it at all. But I know that there were just things that kept coming up, things in the Bible that, that maybe one place said one thing and another said something else, or some places, and you have to admit, there are certain places in the Bible that are, you just scratch your head and go, what in the world is this about? Add on to that the, the reality of suffering and evil in the world and I was in just a really tough spot. But, you know, I didn't know who to talk to. I didn't know if I would be safe speaking to anybody. So I kept it all to myself. I kept it all inside my head, which is actually it's a very scary place. You really don't want to go there. But I tried to struggle and deal with it on my own, which is never the way to do anything. At the same time, life started playing just some dirty, nasty tricks on me and throwing me these crazy curveballs. Things like my husband being deployed for two years to Iraq at the very beginning of the war. My teenage sons and I never knew when he was coming home. We were never given a date or a time. And every night when I would go to bed, I would dream of a man knocking on the door in a uniform to give me the worst news of my life. Every night I dreamed that. My son, when he was 17, decided he would follow in his dad's footsteps and went off and en enlisted in the army. As soon as he was finished with his basic training in schools, they sent him to Iraq for a one-year deployment. He came home, and not much longer after that, they sent him back over there. And the second time he was there, he was injured, and he had to be medevaced out and back to the U.S., and is now a disabled vet. All these things happened before he was 20 years old. I was struggling with cancer myself at the time, and so... I'm not saying any one single thing, again, was the trigger that, that created this situation. I think it probably was a little bit of all of it. But regardless of how it happened, I found myself in 2011 at a place where I said, I don't believe any of it anymore. I, I don't believe it. I was terrified. I was disgusted. I, w I was so angry at myself. I couldn't believe that that little bitty girl who struggled with a huge family Bible and read her dad in, in his lap every night was it the same person who was standing there saying, I don't believe any of it anymore. You know, in the South, we have a term for that. We say, it's all just hogwash. If you're not from the South, look it up in the dictionary. I'm sure it's there. But in March of 2012, on Palm Sunday, Actually, believe it or not, I mean, the next set of events, you just can't make this stuff up. It's pretty crazy. But on Palm Sunday, I left the church, and I walked away from the pulpit. I walked away from my faith, and I walked away from God. Over the next week, the most ridiculous, crazy set of circumstances occurred. And I found myself on Easter weekend. Again, I told you this is crazy. And you just got to take my word for it. Actually, you can look on the internet. It's all there. I mean, trust me. But I wound up in Washington, D.C. for a rally that was followed by an atheist conference. And while I was there, that craziness continued, and I was asked by the organizers to speak, get this, to speak on Easter Sunday. Former pastor, grew up sitting on daddy's lap, loving God, now in 2012 on Easter Sunday is about to speak to a conference of couple thousand atheists. I stood up there and I came out publicly as a non-believer. Changed everything. But I forgot something that's really, really important when I was up there speaking. There are these things that you may have heard of, this cool piece of technology. It's called a smartphone. 
and i don't know if you know this but they're capable of snapping photos and taking video and by the time i went to bed that night the news had spread like wildfire people had recorded videos and they were uploading them to youtube and social media and i mean it was everywhere i started getting phone calls asking me to do interviews to be on news shows i got invitations to speak at other conferences and events i was just overwhelmed by it all when i got home i found a different reception though i was still getting phone calls and emails and messages but these were of a totally different subject uh, type they were hate mail death threats against me and my family they were uh, people walking away people i'd loved and cared for for years just abandoned me completely and shunned me people that i still love that i still miss that i still pray every night that they will call me or email me or, or come back into my life in some way i lost my community probably 95 percent in just one stroke of a of a clock didn't know what to do so i started i went to conference invitations started went on the conference circuit was eventually employed within the the atheist movement by one of the largest organizations uh, in the United States and just kind of lived my life. Started building a new community, building new friendships. And in 2013, I wound up in San Diego, California to speak at a humanist conference. And while I was there, I gave a talk about community and about the importance of it and how as, as humanists, as free thinkers, there's a lot of words for the atheist movement. It's like free thinkers, non-believers. Yeah, just, it's all the same thing. Um, but I gave a talk on community. At the end of it, the chaplain from Harvard University, the humanist chaplain, came up to me and told me about a project that he was building called the Humanist Community Project. And he needed a director. And what I would do is, is train and recruit and equip people within the, the humanist world to build communities, to build things that are kind of just like humanist churches. I was a church planter, for lack of a better term. So I, I was thrilled about the job and I took the job and I moved to Cambridge with my family. My husband took an early retirement and, and we packed up the whole house, the dogs, everything and, and we were gone. The New York Times took an interest in this story and actually they wrote an article, I don't know, six weeks after I was there and they included one line in that article stating that I had graduated from Duke Divinity School with a master's, which I did not. I attended Duke for a course of study. If you're a Methodist, you understand the very complicated way that we, we have for people to go through ministry and all the different little steps. And maybe if you're a Methodist, you don't understand it either. I mean, it's really pretty complicated. But I didn't graduate. The folks at Duke were not really happy about this at all, as you can imagine. And they contacted the Times. The Times printed a retraction, and poof, everything was gone. I confessed it publicly. I mean, why try to hide from it? Didn't try to cover it up, didn't do anything. Just found myself at the bottom of this pit, this hole that I dug for myself. I didn't understand why or how that had happened. It took a little time afterwards to figure out it. I think, maybe, it was because I didn't want to lose that community. So people assumed that I had had a certain amount of education when I first came into the movement. And when I realized it, I didn't know how to deal with it or how to stop it, so I just did nothing. And as these things always do, there comes a point where you can no longer just keep your mouth shut. You actually have to open your mouth and say the same things. And I did that. It was one of the most horrible things, one of the most horrible times that I ever experienced in my life. To say that I'd hit rock bottom, I think that's actually an understatement. I was not aware that there was a place so low. You know, in the South, we, of course, will say some cool little phrases. I'm giving you an education on the South and our lingo. Uh, just in case you've never heard it. We say lower than a snake's belly. Well, no, that's, that's not even a good descriptor. I was in the worst place of my life. I didn't want to get up in the morning. I didn't want to go anywhere. I stayed in bed. We came back to Alabama. I mean, where else were we going to go? Um, in the mornings, I would wake up, and for the first few minutes, I'd forget what had happened, and then it would come crashing back down on me. And I wallowed in it. I stayed there. I laid on those rocks. I went, you know, the slimy, nasty, smelly, 
disgusting place I was in until I just decided that can't be the last chapter of my life. They can't write on my gravestone, here lies Teresa McBain. She fell and decided she'd never get back up. So I started seeing a therapist and, and working through and trying to figure out just who I was and what had happened to me, not just the Harvard thing, but, but everything over the last number of years. And here's the funny thing about this whole story. You know, I said that this was the worst thing that ever happened in my life. It still is. I wish I could go back and change it all. I wish I could go on the internet and erase everything. I wish you couldn't Google my name and find anything. It would just come up and say, no results for that name. But that's not the case. And as much as I want to change it, I don't want to change it. And as much as it's horrible, it's probably the best thing that ever happened to me. Because without that, I would have never, ever taken the time or even acknowledge the fact that there was some stuff that I needed to look at and to deal with on the inside. That there was actually a real person down there that I'd covered up for years with perfectionism and, and trying to be good enough. You see, growing up, my idea of grace and my idea of was God was this evil overlord. If I was good enough, if I did the right things and said the right things and wore the right clothes and listened to the right music and watched the right TV and hung out with the right people, then God would accept me and God would love me and I would be able to go to heaven when I died. That's not true. That is a flawed view of, view of grace. Say that five times fast. It's completely and totally wrong. The Bible doesn't even teach that. But somehow, in that fundamentalist upbringing, that's what I believed. And in order to find the person who, who was inside underneath all that mess, it took the events that had occurred over the few years, over the previous few years. During that time, nothing would calm me down. I couldn't find peace. I couldn't find rest. I'd seen the doctor, and they gave me Valium and all these other things, and, you know, none of it worked. I was just too far down. I was too deeply inside myself and upset with myself. But... Actually, there was one thing that would do it, and it was the thing that had been a powerful influence for my whole life, which is music. I grew up singing in the choir, eventually became a choir director and worship leader, and it was always something that just I was so passionate about. I pulled out those old songs that we used to sing and played them, worship songs, Chris Tomlin and Third Day and just all these great pieces of music, and when I would listen to them, I would find peace. And I rationalized it, of course. I said, oh, it's just some kind of emotional thing. It's, a, it's sentimental. It's, it's a belief of something in the past, you know, the good old days, the way we want to, to look at it. But as time passed, I started to notice that it's actually a lot more than that. It's hitting me more than just mentally. It's hitting me more than just emotionally or even in some form of sentiment. It's an indescribable way that it's connecting with me spiritually. You know, God speaks to us in a lot of different ways. He doesn't always come when you bow down on your knees and, and you're at the, the prayer rail and you've had communion or you're reading your Bible or you've locked yourself in your closet or gone to the mountains. God speaks to each of us in a particular way. Elijah found this out. In the book of 1 Kings, God had come to Elijah and was going to talk to him. So Elijah ran up to the top of a mountain because he believed that that's where he'd find God. But the Bible says God was not there. Then an earthquake occurred and Elijah felt certainly, oh my goodness, this huge earthquake. God is going to speak to me in the earthquake, but God was not speaking to him there. And a fire occurred. Oh, Moses, the burning bush. Yeah, God's going to speak to me in the fire, but God was not in the fire. Where was God? He spoke to Elijah through his still small voice whisper. See, he had run and tried everything that he had read before and ways other people had heard from God and none of them worked. Why? Because God speaks to us all in a different way. And for me, it was music. That's the way God could strip away everything and, and drive it right into my heart. And that's what changed it for me. One song in particular by a group that I, I loved, uh, 10th Avenue North, a group of young boys. Very powerful music. I remember listening to one of their songs, 
from before on YouTube, and I just let the, the videos play, and the next one came on, and the, the song started out saying, I'm tired, I'm worn, my heart is heavy. From the work it takes just to keep breathing, I've made mistakes, I've let my hope fail. My soul feels crushed from the weight of this world, but I know that you can give me rest, so I cry out with all that I've got left. Let me see redemption win. Let me know this struggle ends, that you can mend a heart that's frail and torn. I want to know a song can rise from the ashes of my broken life because I'm worn. I do remember that day, and I do remember that time, and I know that what I was hearing, that was for me. And that was God saying to me, yes, redemption wins. Yes, I can heal your heart. I can mend it. I can restore everything. Just like with David, who said, my bones are crushed. My heart and flesh cry out for you. When will you come to me? God said, I'm right here. That's grace. That's the story. The lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son. It's grace saying, I can, I can fix this. I can make it right. I can restore you. I knew at that point that I needed to get involved with the community, but to say that I was a little bit scared, well, yeah, I was a little afraid. I was afraid of what people would think, of what they would say. Would they accept me? Would they shun me? Would they assume all sorts of things about me? Would they stereotype me or just take their opinions from YouTube? I was afraid of that, but I knew that it had to happen. So gingerly, I came to First Methodist in Coleman. I sat in the very back row during Advent, snuck in once it started, snuck out before it ended so nobody could talk to me or see me. I didn't wear a disguise, but I really thought about it. Did that a few times, didn't, you know, every other week or every, you know, I don't remember exactly how many times, but by the first of the year in 2016, I decided it was worth it, and I stayed, still hiding out, still coming when nobody would notice me. But it wasn't very long before one of the people who was on staff came up to me and talked to me and I just felt, I don't know, I just felt love. The pastor did the same thing and that week I made an appointment. I figured, well, if this is what it's going to be, she may as well know everything because if they're not going to accept me, then I want to hit the door before it's the whole, the whole congregation that's, that's after me. But she didn't. She embraced me. She wept when I was telling her the story. Met with the worship leader, the band. They all did the very same thing, the thing that I did not expect, the thing that's called grace. I started playing, hiding behind a keyboard, of course, singing, and the music started the healing process and the restoration and redemption process. I found support. I found community. I found hope. All my life, I had a view of grace that was so wrong, so toxic, when in reality, God's grace is about acceptance. There's a theologian who actually says it a lot better than I could ever say it. His name is Paul Tillich. If you never heard of him, look him up. He's online. He describes grace this way. He said, grace is like a wave of light that breaks into our darkness as though a voice were saying, you are accepted, you are accepted, you are accepted by that which is greater than you. Don't do anything. Don't say anything. Don't, don't try to be anything because you are accepted. Everything has been transformed. In that moment, grace conquers everything and reconciliation bridges the gulf of our intellectual presuppositions and nothing is required except acceptance. In April, during Holy Week, I remember Leslie preaching a sermon about Peter and a conversation that Peter had with Jesus after he'd risen. I think their conversation on the seashore is a perfect example of what grace means. If you find yourself struggling to understand God's grace, don't beat yourself up. Even the disciples struggled with understanding grace. 
Jesus, is that you? You're alive. I can't believe you're alive. Okay, I was in the boat, and I wasn't catching any fish, okay? But I heard this voice, and the voice said, cast your net to the other side. And so I'm thinking, no, I'm a fisherman. I know what I'm doing, but I'm not catching any fish, you know? And so I throw that net over there, and then a gaggle of fish pop into that net, and I'm going, this is a total miracle. Who could have done that? I need to know who told me to throw the net to the other side. And boom, I look up, and I mean, there is you. You're looking at me on the seashore going, it is I, the Lord, and you're alive. I can't believe you're alive. <laughs> this is awesome. Andrew, get out of the boat. Come on. Peter, yeah. Do you love me? Yes, I love you. I love you. You're alive. This is so great. Good. And then feed my sheep. Andrew, get out of the boat. Come on, man. It's him. Peter. Yeah. Do you love me? I love you. Yes. And I'm so sorry about that rooster cluck, and I had no idea what that meant, but I do not. I'm better for it. All right. Okay. Then feed my sheep. Andrew, I'm smiling, but I'm serious. Come on, get out of the boat. It's him. Peter. Yeah. Do you love me? Jesus, mere words cannot describe the passion that I have for you. I love you. You know everything. I love you. Good. Good. Then feed my sheep. I didn't even know you had livestock. That is so like you, though. There's something new about you all the time. That's what I love about you. Peter, yeah. do you remember uh, the morning the ladies went to the tomb? Yeah, 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 yeah. We're all in the upper room trying to figure out what to do next, you know, because we thought you were dead. You know, you were dead, you know, and we're trying to figure all that out, you know. And Mary comes running up, and Mary's like saying, beehive, beehive, beehive. And I'm thinking, I'm allergic to bees. Like, keep them out. You know what I'm saying? But as she kept getting closer, I heard her correctly. She was saying, he's alive, he's alive, he's alive. And we're going, who's alive, who's alive? And she said, she was at the tomb, and the tomb was empty. And she said that the, there was an angel there. And the angel said, go tell the disciples and Peter that everything is okay. He is risen. And so me and John, we hightail it down there. And if John says he beat me, he's totally lying, all right? I beat him, FYI, all right, you know? And we get down there, and I'm looking in that tomb, and it is. It is empty. There's nothing in there, you know what I'm saying? And I'm like, what does this mean? What does this mean? And John is right there. John is so good with words. He should write a book. He is so good with words. And John said, don't you get it, Peter? This is everything Jesus said he was going to do, and you did it, and it's done. Let's go. This is so great. Wait, yeah. the angel said what? Uh, go tell the disciples and Peter that everything is okay. He is risen. You've risen. Let's go. This he is said okay. what? Go tell the disciples and Peter. Go tell the disciples and Peter. You said my name. Why did you say my name? Peter, that's grace. No, no, I don't, I don't deserve that because that night people kept coming up to me asking me if I belonged to you, if I was with you, and I kept denying you left and right, all right? No, it'll take me my whole life to make up for what I did. It was unforgivable for no, what I did. No, What I did on the cross was meant to take what is unforgivable and make it forgivable. That's my grace. It's not about you. It's always about me. That's grace, Peter. I think the best real life example for me of grace is my dad. When all this happened in 2012, I called my dad and I told him that I didn't believe anymore. And we sat there, that awkward silence. He was crying. I was crying. I didn't know what to say, and so I just blurted out, I'm sorry, Dad, I didn't mean to be such a disappointment. And he replied, he shocked me by saying with a strong voice, you are not a disappointment. You're my daughter, and nothing you do will ever change that. See, that's grace. Grace is God saying to us, to me, you are my daughter, and nothing you do will ever change that.